us on, online and welcome to Beijing Forum 2020. And uh, also this is the sub forum of ecological civilization and high quality urbanization. And as you know, and the Beijing Forum is an annual international events co-sponsored by Peking University, Beijing Municipal Commission of Education and the Korean Foundation for Advanced Studies. And this sub forum will focus on the ecological civilization and the high quality urbanization, and which is co-organized co by the College of Urban and Environmental Sciences and uh, Peking University Lincoln Center for Urban Development and Land Policy. As you know, uh, this world is rapidly urbanizing and 70% of world population will be urban by 2050. The urbanization level in China has been over 60% and will continue to rise for the next 20 years. And the cities, of course, uh, create a lot of benefit for all of us. However, the rapid urban expansion takes land and water bodies and in ways and weakens ecological system. Cities are also facing the threats of climate change and also the COVID-19 pandem pandemic, promoting us to rethink our model of urbanization. In order to cope with the conflicts between urbanization and ecological protection, the Chinese government has recently accorded a top priority to the construction of ecological civilization and formulated strategies to promote high quality urbanization and encourage nature conservation and ecological restoration. restoration. Ecological civilization is a vision for human activities that social economic development today should not deplete e ecological resources for the future generations and should generate more ecological capital for them. The construction of ecological civilization will be a long process requiring the effort of several generations in academic inquiries and evidence-based practices. It is a major challenge for us to find ways to achieve our vision of high quality urbanization and ecological protection and the conceptual framework of ecological civilization. This, this sub-forum, we will feature the discussions of various topics by five prominent international and domestic scholars. Professor Ruth DeFries will talk about the lessons from nature for urban eco-civilization. Professor Bo Fu will speak on eco-civilization, China's ecosystem restoration and management. Professor Sanjeev Kagram will talk about harness the data revolution and the fourth industrial revolution for sustainable and prosperous cities. Professor Peng Gong will speak on healthy cities, planetary health and eco-civilization. And finally, Professor Jin Tao, Jin Tao Xu will report China's transition toward a green and low carbon economy. Now let's invite our first speaker, Professor Luz DeFries. Let me introduce her briefly. She is a university professor, Danish family professor of sustainable development in the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology, Columbia University. DeFries uses images from the satellite and the field service to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are changing land use throughout the tropics. Her research quantifies how these land use changes affect climate, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, as well as human development. DeFries was elected as a member of the U.S. National Ac Academy of Sciences, that is one of the country's highest scientific honors. She also received a MacArthur Genius Award and is the recipient of many other honors for her scientific research. In addition to over 100 scientific papers, she is also committed to communicating the nuances and the complexities of sustainable development to the popular audiences through her books, 
the big Russia, how humanity thrives in the face of natural crisis, and what would nature do, a guide for our uncertain times. Professor Luz, and I will give you around 30 minutes. And now let's start your talk, please. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Well, it is a wonderful honor to be with you here this morning with everyone in the room and everyone online. And thank you for organizing this subforum on this topic of urbanization, because this is one of the most critical issues that is facing our future and our prosperity. Never before has uh, human civilization had so many people living in cities. This is a new way for humanity to exist. What I would like to discuss today is how we might think about how we persist as a urban species and particularly what can we learn from nature for how we can live in this new way of being as an urban species for a prosperous uh, and, and safe world for everyone. So if we take a long time, uh, look over the long time scale, our urban civilization is very, very recent. So our species has been on earth for several hundred thousand years. For most of that time, the vast majority of that time, humans lived as hunters and foragers. About 12,000 years ago, people began farming. And it was only a few thousand years ago that ancient civilizations had urban centers where people lived together and uh, ruled over the countryside from the urban centers. But even at that point, the proportion of people living in urban areas was very, very small. Even uh, in the Industrial Revolution, as energy became available, uh, we've seen increases in urbanization. And, uh, and now uh, it's only extremely recent that so many people, more than half the world's population and increasing, uh, is living, by, living in urban areas. Of course, this varies by country, but nearly every country in the world is urbanizing rapidly. And this is a new way for humans to exist. And only in the last century, uh, the last few decades, have, uh, have this, has this urbanization uh, increased in so many countries around the world. So how do we live as an urban species? This will determine our future. This is a fundamental shift because with people living in cities requires energy coming from elsewhere, food coming from elsewhere, water coming from elsewhere, coming from the countryside, and waste that need to be disposed of coming from the cities. So this makes people in living in cities dependent, completely dependent, on the, uh, on the countryside for their energy, water, for all of their resources. And this is a very new way for our species to exist. As we just heard, uh, urbanization has many benefits. We've seen such incredible advances over the last few decades in so many aspects of human well-being, in, in health, in literacy, in life expectancy, because an urban world, people can uh, benefit from delivery of health services, from education, access to jobs, access to goods. So we've seen these enormous achievements and improvements, particularly in China, but elsewhere around the world. So there are great benefits to this way of existing as an urban species. But there's also uh, some dangers that come along with being a, 
uh, living as an urban species. And that arises because we are so connected. Being urban means we're connected. We're connected to other places for our very basic survival. And this kind of connection and complexity brings unpredictability into our world because as we've seen with so many issues as the pandemic, that, uh, that, that we can have a spread across the network in ways that we never had before. That this dependency and this connection to other places is, uh, is subject to shocks and disruptions for whether it's from disease or from economic collapse or from extreme climate events that can ricochet and cascade uh, throughout countries and throughout the world. So we have little experience with knowing how we manage, humanity manage its affairs to live in this kind of interconnected world. But nature, this is not new to nature. Nature has lived with this kind of unpredictable complexity for a, a very, very long uh, time. Nature is fundamentally dependent on, on networks such as leaf veins that move water, slime molds that have to send out its tentacles to get food, uh, food webs where uh, species are dependent on a web of interactions to, to get their uh, food. So we are not so different from nature, this urban world that we've created, these, this highly connected world. So what can we learn from nature in how to, how to persist and how to survive through these uncertainties? So nature, these networks in nature have been have survived for billions of years through many kinds of disruptions, through extinctions, through asteroids crashing into the earth, through swings in climate. And evolution has devised ways to persist through these disruptions. So I've been thinking about that question for a couple of years. And uh, and put together this book. <laughs> with some thoughts about what are the strategies that we can learn in, this, in these unpredictable, uncertain times that come from being in this highly interconnected world. So in this book, I, uh, I, I talk about four different strategies that nature uses to persist through uncertainty. What I wanna do today is share two of those strategies which are most relevant to urbanization and think about how that might help us think about how we live and how we govern and how we manage our resources in this urban world that we are now uh, in. So one of these strategies is to think about how we construct our networks. So cities are at the hubs of networks and receiving food, receiving water, receiving energy, sending out wastes, highly connected in, uh, in a network. And over evolution, networks in nature have figured out ways to be resilient to disruptions that might occur in their network. And if you look at a leaf vein, if next time you go outside and look very carefully at the veins in a leaf, you will see that these uh, these leaf veins are very redundant. There's a lot of different pathways that water can move through in a leaf. So these leaf veins are essential to a plant to be able to carry water throughout the leaf and bring sugars back to the plant. So these, these networks are, are essential to the survival of, uh, of plants. So over the evolution, there's been this construction of these networks in a redundant strategy so that there's many different pathways to get from one point to another point. If there is a disruption in the network, such as these holes in the leaf, such as an insect taking a bite out of a leaf, there is another route. There is another way to go around that hole 
and have minimized disruptions to the network. Early in evolution, the earliest plant, the earliest tree, the ginkgo, did not have this kind of uh, redundant leaf network. It had that kind of branching network that, that you can see there. And, uh, and that is subject to disruption. So if there is a, a bite taken out of that, uh, that leaf vein at some point, it disrupts the flow of water to the, uh, to, to the rest of the upper part of the leaf. So over time, evolution has designed its or devised its strategy to have this kind of loopy, redundant network, even though the plant has to invest its resources in creating this redundant network to be able to have many different pathways, many different ways to move around if there is some disruption in the network. In general though, our human made networks tend to not be like that redundant network in leaf veins, but to be more like uh, hub and spokes. So this is the network from the uh, Emirate Airlines, you could look at any airlines and it would probably look something like this, where there's a hub and spokes kind of network strategy. And that is highly efficient. There is a reason that airlines construct their networks like that, because it's very efficient, as long as there's not a disruption. So if you were trying to get from Orlando on the left side of the map to Auckland, New Zealand on the right side of the map, and go through Dubai, that will work. You will get there as long as there is no disruption in Dubai. But if there is a disruption in that hub, then the entire network falls apart. And that's what the leaf veins tell us and evolution tells us that there is value in investing in a redundant network strategy, even if it's sacrificing some efficiencies so that there are options to be able to, uh, to, to move, move our resources around. So we've learned this. So there's some, uh, some ways in our human organization where we've learned this lesson that redundancy uh, can be beneficial even though it's less efficient. And one story that is in the book that, that illustrates that uh, realization is the story of Paul Barron, who in the 1950s during the Cold War, uh, he was tasked with devising a communications network and uh, that later become the foundation of the internet. So initially at that time, the thinking was that this centralized network strategy, the hub and spokes kind of Emirate Airlines strategy was the most efficient. That's the best way to devise, design a communications uh, network strategy. Paul Barron, he was young at the time, he proposed, he tested different strategies and he proposed that the communications network would be better off if it were more like this distributed strategy, the one on the right, which is like a leaf vein. He was probably not thinking about leaf veins at the time, but through his, uh, through his thinking about the strategies, he proposed that this kind of redundant distributed strategy would be safer and less subject to disruption if there is an attack on some part of the network. Now he proposed this as a young, uh, young scientist, and he was he was laughed at the laughed out of the room. Nobody took him seriously in the defense department or uh, in the communications world. And uh, later on, decades later, the designers of the internet came upon his strategy and used it as a way to create redundancy in the, in the internet, which is what makes the internet possible, uh, what made it possible to be able to, uh, to conduct the communications. So there is some learning that investments in redundancy in networks can be beneficial, but in other ways, we have a lot to learn with this strategy. So if we think about the way that the global food trade has evolved over time 
and this is the, the network that feeds our cities, it has become less redundant, more like the airlines hub and spokes than like a redundant leaf vein. So while that global food trade where you have production concentrated in a few parts of the world that are uh, exported to a lot of other places in the world, that is very efficient and it has gotten a lot of food to a lot of places, uh, but it also creates some fragility in the system because if something happens in, that, in those food producing parts of, of which many, many countries are so dependent and many, many cities are so dependent, then we have cascading failures and, uh, and disruptions. And that is exactly what happened in the food price spikes of 2011, where there were some droughts and some climate uh, extremes in some of the food producing parts of the world, which reduced supply, which increased prices, which led countries to react by restricting their exports, which further increased uh, prices, food prices. And that problem ricocheted around the world into cities around the world and contributed to, uh, some people say, contributed to the Arab Spring and the increase in the price of bread um, which led to the food riots and, uh, and destabilization with the enormous geopolitical consequences of the fallout from the Arab Spring. So this network, the way that we think about our networks that feed our cities and provide water to our cities and, and uh, supply all the resources that cities need is um, consequential to how we think about the future and the ability of cities to persist. So that's one strategy that we might think about and from nature is how we design our networks to be resilient to disruptions. So when we need the uh, food trade to work and we need water to flow and we need resources to come into cities, we can think about learning from a leaf vein and having redundant investments in redundant network strategies to, uh, to persist through disruptions. Now, sometimes networks can be dangerous as they are, as we see with the pandemic. And, uh, and this is the same problem that social insects such as ants and termites have. These social insects who live in highly concentrated, like our cities, highly concentrated, uh, dense populations that are very subject to a, a pandemic, epidemic sweeping through a colony. But it doesn't happen very often that a, a colony of ants or termites is wiped out by a, uh, a pathogen, a disease that gets into the network. Because what evolution, the strategy of evolution has been to make those those social networks of social insects modular so that if there is a pathogen that comes into some part of the network, it completely closes off, shuts down, much as the successful strategies for controlling the pandemic to stop the flow. So when we think about what we need for our cities in terms of the networks that feed the cities and take wastes away and supply water to the cities and keep cities free from, uh, free from the spread of diseases. How do we think about uh, creating redundant networks so that we are not subject to disruptions in the supply chain, but we are also modular enough so that the, 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 uh, the flows that we don't want coming into cities, such as diseases, can be cut off in a modular kind of strategy. So that's one, uh, one lesson that I take from, from, uh, from nature is about the architecture of our networks that is so relevant in our urban world. Another strategy from nature is uh, diversity. So 
nature is incredibly diverse in terms of the number of species. There are millions and millions of species in the world. We don't even know how many. Uh, and diversity has increased over time. And the great benefit for, of diversity for nature and for any life is that there are options. That if one species goes extinct, one species in a food ch chain goes extinct for some reason, disease or, or some reason, that there are options, that there are different ways for the food web to persist, that there are uh, that there is a library of options. So there's not a single dependency on a particular species, that there are many that can fulfill the role. So again, that's not the most efficient way that we can think about organizing is to have diversity of, of options in our uh, possibilities for the crops that we grow or, uh, or um, our, our resources. But over time, nature has persisted because it has had that diversity. So that when there has been a shock, uh, uh, as, happened, as has happened five times in geologic history, that life persists. Life does not go extinct because there are options that can, uh, that can come in place when there is a disruption. And again, some parts of humanity have learned this lesson very well. This is, of course, a very established principle in financial markets and investors that diversity is good. Bet hedging, this is an idea that won the Nobel Prize, that investing in a diversified portfolio is safer, even though it might not give the highest returns at any particular time, that there is a benefit to having a diversity in not just the investments, but in the types of investments, so that if there is a, uh, a crash in some type of investment, whether it's a pub, a mining or some type of investment, that, uh, that others are there so that there is not a complete crash. So this is the idea of not putting all the eggs in one basket, even though that might be sacrificing some returns over the, uh, the short term. So that is clearly a strategy that is embedded in finance and it is also has allowed nature to persist over so many billions of years. But again, when we think about the, uh, the food that feeds our urban world, uh, that is becoming less diverse, that over time that our food basket for humanity is, uh, is being concentrated in a handful of species. So at this time, three species, wheat, rice, and maize, contribute over half of the calories that feed humanity. And this is becoming more concentrated over time as, uh, as we live in a more uh, globalized world where diets are homogenizing, and particularly in cities which are uh, which diets and cities are becoming more homogeneous and less dependent on local varieties and, um, and concentrated in a few, uh, a few species. So while that's beneficial from an efficiency point of view, the danger there is that there are, uh, that we lose options and this is, a uh, uh, trend that is happening in, uh, in China, as you can see from this paper here, and in uh, many places around the world, where the, uh, what we might call minor cereals or orphan crops that are very well adapted to the climates of the places where they grow, and in many cases, very nutritious, uh, have been declining in this homogenization of our food system. So that's a, that cuts off some of our options for feeding our urban world in that these very nutritious uh, cereals that have, are locally adapted, so 
thousands and thousands of varieties that are locally adapted to conditions. Those are the species that will help us uh, breed new varieties and have the kinds of traits that we need in a world where climate is changing and, uh, and uh, we need to get nutrition uh, into the foods that people, uh, people eat. So in terms of being resilient, this diversity is incredibly uh, important and it's being, uh, it's being lost. And that is relevant for cities because every, everybody who lives in cities is 100% dependent uh, on the food that is grown in the countryside. And if there is a disruption to that, uh, that production system, then the ability to feed the cities is in jeopardy. So we might think, this is a picture on the left here of the Svalbard Seed Vault, which is in Norway above the Arctic Circle. And we might think that ha ha that has nothing to do with cities, but it actually has everything to do with cities because that is the, uh, the safety, uh, some people call it the doomsday vault. That is where the seeds that are come from the crops that are grown around the world are stored in case of disruption, then those seeds are available and can be bred into new crops. And that is our library of options as we have to produce enough food to feed nine to 10 billion people to be able to have those options for the types of traits of climate resilience and nutrition that we need to feed the world. So feeding cities might seem distant from maintaining diversity on our farms and maintaining seed vaults and investing in maintaining this diversity, but it is absolutely essential to keep that diversity, to maintain the diversity of food production systems, the diversity of, uh, of crops. So those are, uh, two strategies that nature tells us is worth the investment, the thinking about the architecture of our networks and thinking about how we can maintain diversity. Uh, in this book, there's a couple of other strategies that I talk about that are more related to how we govern ourselves, which is, uh, which is another set of questions for our highly urban interdependent world. Uh, so, we, what I'm trying to get to in this, in this book and thinking about how nature is not only um, so important for our well being, but it also can guide us and have lessons for how nature has persisted for so long, for billions of years in an uncertain world when there's unpredictable disruptions that, that can occur, and how nature over time. Uh, ha shows us that these strategies can help us think about this very new way of being for our species, living in an urban world, prospering in our urban world, and that we have more in common with leaf veins and slime molds and food webs than, than we might think. So I thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to the uh, presentations coming up and uh, just to close out and remind us that we have so much to learn from nature for how our urban eco-civilization can prosper in the future. Thank you. Ooh, can't hear. I can hear. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Professor Luce. And uh, certainly your, your talk is very, very uh, insightful and then the uh, human society can learn from nature and uh, build network and maintain diversity, all others. 
And uh, we will take take quest, question from the audience when our speakers finish their talk. And now let's, let's invite our second speaker, Professor Bo Jin Fu. And uh, he is a professor in geography and landscape ecology at the Research Center for Eco Environmental Sciences, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's also a professor at the Beijing Normal University, and he's an uh, academician of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, also a fellow of Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, and uh, also a corresponding fellow of the Loyal Society Edinburgh, UK, and the vice president of International Geography for IU, and many other honors. Uh, let's welcome Professor Fu Bo Jie to speak on uh, to speak on uh, eco eco civilization, China's ecosystem restoration and management. And welcome, Professor Fu. Uh, can you look at the, my PPT? Yeah. Thank you very much for Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is my great pleasure to, to be here is uh, talking about uh, eco-civilization, uh, China's ecosystem restoration and uh, management. So as you know, our human being is uh, through from the Hanti civilization, uh, agriculture, civilization, uh, industry civilization, and now we are uh, go forward is uh, ecological civilization. Ecological civilization is a historical choice for our human development. Uh, ecological civilization is the sum of the materials and uh, spiritual achievements by human being uh, follow the objective is the law of the human nature and the social economic harmonious development. So ecological civilization is a core idea. It's also is a tradition Chinese culture is an idea, is a heaven and man wellness. It's a core idea for ecological civilization is a respect for nature, conform to nature and protector is the nature. A respect for nature is uh, it's not only is for our uh, human is a central name. Uh, it's not a, a only, uh, it also is not for nature central name. So need to uh, coordinate is a company is a human and the nature systems. Also conform for nature is a way uh, must understand is a uh, nature we learn from the nature. Uh, just uh, Professor Ruth is uh, introduced for the organization should be learn a lot of from the nature. We designed is a uh, human and the nature conform conform name is uh, societies. It's also is a uh, protection. Protect is the nature. We need is uh, from the development. Is a build is a development is a society. Also for heaven and the man and the wellness, uh, this is a union is a heaven and the human is a very important is a feature in Chinese culture tradition that is a distinguish from the other is a culture. Uh, for example, is a constant name is the Buddha's. Also, is uh, those things all show is uh, this is uh, idolization. So is uh, have the different uh, explanation, but uh, is the uh, most uh, is uh, respect of the nature uh, is uh, based on the nature is uh, for social economic development. But why we need is a uh, eco civilization in the human well being also for the noise days. For example, is the uh, nature uh, uh, capital is uh, become is a uh, determining is a factor for economic development. It's also the in the industry is a 
civilization, the human well-being is a didn't is a growth in face with the economic development. We should be think about is a long term is a human well-being. Also, is a ecological civilization is a revolutionary rethinking of the industry civilization. Also, ecological civilization advocate is a ecological origin is a modernization, ecological origin for development. Also, ecological civilization aims to guide is a more human well-being and expand is a less is a nature resource and the nature conceptions. But in China, is the during is the ten years we are promote we are is a put forward is the ecological civilization. This is a innovation pathway to ecological civilization. It involves is a many many aspects. For example, is the green development as a leading heuristic for social development. Also, is a openness is a special layout of the is the land and the tourist uh, the industry. Also, is the tradition industry is upgrade, uh, promote energy uh, conservation and emission reduction. Development is a circular economy, uh, or just uh, is a uh, energy is a structure is a enhance is the environment production for control is the air pollution, the soil pollution, and the soil is a remediation. Uh, particularly for promote uh, is the ecological protection and the restoration. Also institution innovation for ecological civilization. Also national uh, participants in the pro environment protection. Now I would like to give you an example is from the only from the ecosystem restoration and management is in China. This is a one pathway to the eco civilization is a route in China. You know, is a China has a diverse ecosystem and the landscape. Is from the north to south, from the tropic to the cold is a, is the temperature, from the east to west, from the humidity to the uh, arid is the land and the Tibet Plateau is the high elevations. So for nature is a condition and a landscape, but is the ecosystem is the figures is in China. For example, we have is the arid and the semi-arid area. It's about is the 52 percent of the land. Uh, for example, is the Lurus Plateau, is the Tibet Plateau, is the dry land is area. Also in the south part is the north uh, is the southwest. We have the cast is a, is a landform. This is a, is a figure is the ecosystem and the landscape. But we population and the resource is a unbalanced is the distribution. For example, is a sixteen four percent of the arable land is located in the north part of China, but is only is 18% uh, of the water resource in north part of China. Is 82% uh, of the water resource distributed in the south part of China. Also is uh, for population, now we have the 1.4 billion is a population, but is uh, most, is about is 90% in the east part of China. Is only is uh, six, percent is the population in the west part of China. So is uh, China is the ecosystem has a big challenge is uh, for development, for social and economic development. For example, we have the huge is the population, the fast is the urbanization is now about is 60%. Is a fast economic uh, growth also is a massive the natural resource exploitations. So it's along with is a fast economic uh, development, uh, we have to face a lot of the ecological and environmental issues. 
for example, is the desiccation, is the dust, is the weather and the pollution and the soil erosion. So in the year 1988, is the Chinese academic census established is a Chinese ecosystem research network. It is a long-term ecological monetary research and demonstration. You know, is a, which is a, one of the largest is a national scale ecosystem of observation. It's a network in the world. It's a with the LTR in the United States and the environment change network is in Britain. So now we have is a 44 sites is the stations involved is a for agriculture, forestry, grassland, is a desert, lake, gulf, wetland, and is urban ecosystem. It's the dis distribution, it's all of the China's is the ecosystem and the landscape. Uh, but we also have is the five disciplinary center is a for water, soil, air, uh, biologic and aquatic is the ecology, uh, which is uh, for monetary the data quality is the control. Also, with the shine uh, is the technically is the training for our is the research site in the field. We still we also have the one system center for integrated analysis and is the is the data analysis is the data collection and the data training. So this is the biggest is uh, the internet. Uh, is a network is for ecosystem monetary research. Is the objective of the Chinese ecosystem research network. This is involves the ecological monetary. This is the continental is a measure and the record of the change of the ecosystem structure, process and function. Also it's for some is the services. For ecological research to understand ecosystem dynamics and the mechanism in response to the environment change, particularly for global change and human activities. Also, is the we have the ecological uh, application. This is a, is a one of the arm we different with is other is the national scale is a network. We need to development and demonstration, ecological restoration technique and measurements to option to enhance for ecosystem services. We need to link with the local government is a share our is a restoration is a model to is a local people and the local government. For overlook if the China's is a eco eco ecosystem management is a policy is a change. You know, is a establish is a new is a, a China is a from the 1914 to 1918, 1949 to 1980s, uh, is the country focused on the is agriculture development. This is, we need is more food uh, is for is for the is the peoples. Uh, after is the open door is in China from the 1980 to 1919. This is a transfer from the agriculture from the arable uh, is the uh, agriculture to the uh, ecological restoration. Is a, some of the ecosystem project uh, restoration project can be done is a, in that stage. Particularly in the after 2000 is years is a ecosystem restoration is a cover. It's all countries, it's all ecosystem. I, I will be introduced is a, some of the for you for ecological conservation and restoration program. We have the national scale as a, some of the local scale. It's all is the funding is from the central government and the part is from the, is the local government. For example, biodiversity conservation and the production area system. Three North Shirt Bed is a program. It's a nature first conservation program, the Grand Green program, and is a key ecological function area and the ecological conservation red line also is a key conservation and restoration program from the important ecosystem. For is the local level also is launched by the central government link with the local government. The, for example, is a project from the wind and the sandy sunny areas that control around Beijing and Tianjin. The three river source for the ecological 
programmed in the Tibetan plateau is a rocket desiccation control is a program in the in the west uh, southwest uh, is uh, in China. I give you an example. For example, uh, ecosystem function conservation area in the ten years ago is a we divided is the critical region is for the ecosystem service in China. It's the addition is a 63 area for correct ecosystem services. Also, is a, this is a made is a 49 uh, line, uh, of the China is a land area. Is based on the is a water resource is a conservation is a biodiversity conservation is a soil uh, protection and the standing fix and the flood mitigations. Also based on uh, this is uh, my also we link with uh, social economic development. You know, is a uh, 2011s state council of the China issue is a must function zone in the plan. This is a uh, garden is uh, for four for ten years is no is a uh, four type is a uh, regions. This is a uh, optimized development regions is the uh, most is uh, located in the east China. Particularly in the Yangtze River Delta, in the Pearl River Delta, is for city, mega city, for development is the regions. Is for priority is the developed regions and most located is the plant, is for agriculture development and so on. For construction development region, also is a forbidden development region. It's a two, is a regions, it's the most for protection for biodiversity conservation and ecological restoration is the regions. But we also selected is from eight demonstration regions for our research for ecological restoration. For example, is the Tarimo River base in the inner, uh, inland is the river, largest inland river. Also Lowers Plateau it also is, uh, is is a desiccation control is a rocket is a, and a, a three source river protection. For I give you an example is a four hour is a study area and the regions we are needed to development is a best practice for ecosystem management. Also for practice technology and approach for vegetation restoration. Also for some is a desiccation and uh, so erosion control technology. This is uh, after is uh, 10 years is uh, restoration is a product uh, in the uh, in the subtropic is the area. This is uh, is uh, after five years is a restoration uh, in the cast is a, is a regions for some is a restoration. This is uh, for desiccation control in our is a research sites. After is uh, 50 years uh, from the uh, 1960s uh, established is uh, the research sites in the west part of China. You can find the uh, first from the shift down, down fixed by shrub, down fixed by bush. Also, is a planted is a shrub. Also, is the nature is a restore, uh, restore. By Yinchen is a moles is a mega it, It's a good is a evolution. This is a plantation. It's a in the Lurus is a plateau. Uh, is a twenty years ago. It's also is a uh, for for grassland is a in the is a west part of the Lurus plateau for restoration. This is the Beijing Shenzhen sand source is a control. Is a product is a Lurus plateau, you know, found that before is a 1918, is a cut is a steep, is a flat, uh, steep, uh, is a farmland. But it is a 1918 to 2000, uh, part of the for landscape engineering is a control is erosion. But after is a 2000, is a most for plantation for trees and grasses. Grass is a serenal shield is a program is a nature forestry is a program. Also, this is a paper is a Australia 
in the scientist collaboration with the Chinese scientists published in Nature. It's an investment for uh, ecological restoration in China. Uh, is he calculate is the 16th restoration project is a investment. This figure is a shell. This is a from is a 1998. It's in here to the 2015 investment from the central government. It's an increase. It's a dramatically it's an increase. But it's also is a vegetation the coverage is the during past 20 years. Also, is a dramatic change in the greening. You can find uh, is the most uh, is the, is the Chinese is the land is the green, particularly in the Lurus Plateau is the North Healing is the China, also is the West part. Uh, give an example is the dust is the weather in Beijing is a from is the last center to know is a, is a reduced is a dramatically. Also is the soil erosion uh, is a uh, redux is a dramatically is a, in the uh, 34 is a percent is after is the plantation and the restoration. Is the soil erosion is a, uh, in the national is the levels from the 2000, 2010s is uh, decrease by the 5.6%. Uh, but this equation is also from past is 2000, 2010 is about is a six point is a percent. Most is the control uh, in the eco term in the agriculture and the grassland is the area. As a rocket, rocket dislocation is from the 2000, 2010s, also is a decrease is 4.7. You can find this is the area in the west, southwest part in most is a, is a, is a greening. So is a, uh, some scientists from Howard University is a leading is a published is a paper in the Nature Sustainability in the last years. Is a title is a China and the Indian lady is a greening uh, of the world the through is a land use is a management. You can find this is a, is a is a China, but is in India is the most from the corporal is a management to increase is the greening. We also publish is a paper for the ecosystem services evaluation uh, after is a, is a 20 to 2010. Uh, you can find from the ecological uh, restoration is a program. For example, slope is a club for the forestry uh, uh, program. This is a for grand green. The program is a, uh, also is a for nature forestry production program uh, give you is a three is a program. Uh, most uh, is the ecosystem services have been is, uh, is the increase for carbon sequestration, for soil rotation and uh, sun uh, storm, also is the water is the rotation. So for biodiversity conservation and uh, protection area also systems, the first is the nature reserve in China established is 1956. But now the total number is over, uh, is 11,000 was established in the, uh, China. Its coverage is 18% uh, of the China's land is uh, uh, terrestrial. Also from the state forest administration, uh, so issue is the uh, wide is the protection for nature conservation uh, program in the 1999. The promoter is a rapid established is a nature reserve. You can find for nature reserve. This is after is a 2000 is a increase. Also first first park is a geo park. Also is a central government issue. China biodiversity conservation strategy is a, also original is a name list is the first issue for the 
production in the plants and uh, animal, uh, uh, animals. No uh, Chinese government is making the new uh, protection area system is the planning. According to the new policy, our duty uh, our oriented protected area will be the uh, group into the three major types. Uh, one is the uh, national parks. Uh, second is the uh, nature reserves. Also for is a uh, is a uh, nature park. Nature park uh, is uh, involved first park, wetland park, citizen uh, sports, and the geo park. This is the uh, work will be finished. This end of the, this year's. This uh, figure is a uh, show you is the China's nature is a, a reservation. Uh, is a, uh, we have the three uh, two levels. One is the national level. Another is the provincial level. Uh, it's a made up is eighteen percent of the land first of the China. Uh, another is the ecological uh, restoration program. It is. Uh, uh, three North Shirt is a program. This uh, started from the 1979s for control in the desertification and the dust storm. This uh, program uh, will be finished in the two, uh, 2015. Will be covered is uh, about uh, is, uh, 500 the counties. Is involved in the 13 provinces. Uh, this is uh, for the uh, first plantation and the bush grass is a plantation. Um, to the by the end of the uh, is the twenty eighteen over is the thirty million hands forestry and bush the plantation have been finished. Uh, this fair show me show you is uh, this uh, program is a cover uh, is the north if the China is the thirteen if the uh, provinces for nature forestry conservation and the grant to green in the program. This is a two program. I think this is the largest ecosystem service payment in the program in the world. This is a nature first program started from the 19 is uh, uh, 98 and the grant green program started from 1990. This is a uh, uh, total is a cover 400 billion yuan was the investment for nature first uh, conservation program. Uh, for 500 billion yuan for grant green program to the end of the last years. So based on the uh, ecological regions for ecological protection is the regions, is the government is the pay, is the budget, is the money, is the transfer, is the west pattern of the China is in order to promote conservation in the key ecological function area, central government launch ecological financing transfer program started from the 2008 based on the ecosystem service painting, based on our identity is the ecosystem sensitive is that for nature protection is the area. It's a particular increase from the six billion yuan in the 2008, but from to the 2080 years, it's about is 72.1 billion yuan. It's a benefit county is from is 2010, it's about 437 county, but now is a cover 700 county. This is uh, give you the budget and is a benefit in the, in the counties. Is the central government is a pay is a money to the country also for the farmland, uh, for farmers, the required is the farmer and the local government is a protect uh, ecosystem and uh, uh, ecological restoration. We we'll still have we also have the ecological conservation red line. This is the government is put forward the ecological conservation red line. As you know, we have the arable land is the red line. Uh, we are know we have the ecological conservation red line. Uh, maybe is for the in future, 
We also have the opposition is the red line. The three is the red line is made up is a national is a tourist line that is a planning. This is a coordinate is the three red line in the spatial uh, layout. You know, it's a, by the end of the 2011, it's a red line is a planning. It's, it's a 15 uh, provinces provinces was approved by the state council and released. Uh, but uh, according to the planning, is by the end of the, this year, is all provinces is the red line should be finished, should should be is approved by the state council is in China. This is a, is a, a slide is the show you is a Yunnan provinces is red line is the Jiangxi provinces about is the Zhejiang. In the whole country is about is a 30% is for the red line in the whole countries. For key conservation restoration program, also is important. It's also launch for is this year's for the in the future. In future, we select is a nine product is a for uh, ecosystem ecological restoration. Qinghai Tibet Plateau, Yangtze River Base, Yellow River Base, Northeast China is a North uh, Desecration Area, uh, South China, a uh, coast region. Biodiversity conservation and the protect region also support is a, give support is a project. Principle is a protection first. It's a nature is a restoration is a is a nature base is a for solution. But but we are have uh, got a lot of achievements for the ecological restoration. We still have is a, some challenge. The China is faced the new ecological challenge from the urbanization over exploitation for water resource and the mineral is a resource also for coast is a wetland loss. For ecological restoration need to shift from the area for restoration to the ecosystem quality, ecosystem function and the services is the promote promotion. Ecological restoration need based on the local is a nature, is the environment. This is a, we are is a, adjust our strategy. Also, is the ecological res restoration linking for the improve is a biodiversity from the ecological restoration to the landscape, to the base restoration and uh, management. So I would like to give you is the conclusion is a remark. Is the eco civilization has become is a national strategy of the development of the in China. China has made a greater effort in for ecosystem conservation and restoration and uh, transfer team the investment in the nature capital uh, pay off. The Chinese ecosystem research network is a link uh, ecological monetary research and uh, demonstration. China's ecosystem restoration program has made a greater progress and the ecological benefit and improve the ecosystem services. China is still faced with the new ecological challenges from the urbanization, over exploitation for water resource and mineral resource, also is the cost of wetland is a loss. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Fu. And China has done a lot in restoring its ecosystem, and we certainly have have achieved a lot. And Professor Fu just gave a very thorough review about uh, the eco civilization practices, and he also showed a very rich uh, examples and practices. And also, of course, we face uh, some challenges. This is a long way to go to build the eco civil civilization. And uh, Professor Fu, we will have a question from the audience. Actually, I just checked the broadcasting room, and each has more than 2,000 <laughs> audience in the, in the, in, online. So it's getting very popular. And now let's invite my third speaker, 
um, Professor Sanjeev Kagarin, and he is the Director General and the Dean of the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University, and uh, that's my mother university, yeah? and the Foundation Professor of Global Leadership and the Global Political Economy. He is a world-renowned scholar and a practitioner in the areas of globalization, sustainable development, trans transnationalism, leadership, strategic management, entre entrepreneurship, social enterprise, cross-sector innovation, public-private partnerships, inter-organizational networks, good governance, transparency, the global political economy, human security, and the data revolution. And he most recently led the establishment of the cross-sectoral global partnership for sustainable development data and international open data chapter. And uh, Professor Sanjeev Kagram will talk about harnessing the data revolution and the fourth industrial revolution for sustainable and prosperous, prosperous cities. Um, welcome, Professor Sanjeev. Thank you Please. so much. Thank you so much. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I want to thank the Peking uh, Center, uh, Lincoln Center for Land Policy, also uh, the other hosts of this wonderful and very timely uh, convention uh, and seminar. Uh, I am delighted to be joining here in these very complicated times. First and foremost, I hope that everyone is safe and healthy uh, despite the uncertainty of these times. Uh, and secondly, to thank again our hosts and uh, the organizers. I've enjoyed the presentations by my fellow panelists and I'm honored to be and privileged to be alongside them. So today I am going to focus on harnessing the data revolution and fourth industrial revolution for smart, sustainable and prosperous cities. Uh, let me begin and I have far too much to share so I'll do my best to go as quickly as possible while uh, of course sharing the slides with everyone uh, that uh, in, in the future. Just to share a little bit about the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University, our vision at the Thunderbird School is a world of sustainable and equitable prosperity. And our mission is to educate and influence global leaders and managers who will maximize the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution and certainly minimize its costs. Uh, we at Thunderbird are the number one school for global management in the world. ASU has been ranked number one for innovation for the last six years running. Uh, and most recently we were ranked number one in the United States for SDG impact. Now, various agendas and events have helped shape smart community thinking, smart cities, smart regions, smart states, smart provinces around the world, in China, in the United States, and everywhere else. The rise of the internet, broadband, greatest uh, connectedness for the greatest number, certainly uh, physical security issues. 9-11 uh, was a major, uh, you know, dramatic uh, catalyst for that. Broad awareness of climate change, fires, for example, to focus in Australia and the United States and many other natural uh, 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 ch uh, calamities and disasters, the 2007-2004 economic crisis, and then of course most recently the COVID-19 global pandemic. Now in terms of harnessing the data revolution, just to start off with, it's important to remember as Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, the former CEO of Google said, the world is creating as much data every two days as has been created between the dawn of civilization and 2003. Now that was a uh, a quote from 2004, we now estimate that the, we are creating more data every day <laughs> than we did between the dawn of civilization and now. The Secretary General's uh, task force on the data revolution for sustainable development called for a massive agenda. And out of that came the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data as one of the key multi-stakeholder SDG seven part uh, partnerships uh, that I helped launch, uh, found and architect in 2015. Now, what is the data revolution? Now, data is the oil of the 21st century. It lubricates and makes everything go, uh, and in and turbocharged speed and volumes, intensity and extensity. Uh, what we are seeing here is a range of different types of data, government generated data, obviously official statistics, now often using new technologies, new means of collection, assembly, processing, analysis, geospatial and earth observation data, citizen generated data, private sector, big data, whether that's mobile, uh, cell, phone, cell phone data, uh, financial services data, uh, social media data, admin and financial data, administrative and financial data, oftentimes at the provincial and local level. 
uh, we now have to unleash the innovation and the production accessibility and the use of real time dynamic dis disaggregated data from multiple sources and triangulate and mash up these multiple sources of data uh, and harness it for the greater good. Now, there's a whole data spectrum we I won't go into from closed to shared to open. There is a move from the, the left to the right towards greater shared and open data. Of course, when you have private sector data, that is complicated. And so we've come up with new technological means such as anonymized data, uh, sharing it through uh, different types of means uh, over firewalls, NDAs and what the rest. But as you can see, everyone has learned to value data. Uh, and this is of course, a focus on after Hurricane Katrina uh, back in the United States a while ago. Let me then focus on the fourth industrial revolution in historical perspective. Uh, as we know, the first industrial revolution really began in the 1600s, 1700s with the steam engine. Then we went to the second industrial revolution really you know, marked by the automobile, but also the telephone light bulb, airplane, the Ford Model T plant, really the rise of modern manufacturing. The third internet, uh, industrial revolution really was marked by the internet and the personal computer. And today we've entered perhaps the most complex, fast paced, interconnected and transformative industrial revolution uh, in the world's history. And that, that industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution has only been accelerated as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it's really, as I will share with you next, consisted of uh, 12 catalytic technology types uh, that we should all be paying attention and of course we know is transforming from 3D printing to artificial in uh, intelligence, geoengineering to automation and robots, advanced materials, battery and, battery and energy storage, dramatic transformation, blockchain and distributed led ledger and the internet of things. Well, what does this all mean? Well, before I go there, and in fact, the fourth industrial revolution has been a high speed technological development is a driver of a shift to the, to the circular economy whether they're in our cities, in our regions, the provinces, nationally and globally. The move to a circular economy where we reuse, recycle, reinvest and create closed loops in the production, consumption and transformation of goods and services all over the world is truly a, a, a fabulous direction, uh, move in the right direction. We have well much time, uh, you know, we have much to do still, but really what we see is the intersection of the data revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, and a, a transformation towards a, a circular economies. So how can the fourth IR and the data revolution particularly shape cities and communities? You know, uh, unleashing spare capacities. For example, technology has allowed for sharing of public and private buildings, the use of unused homes for multiple purposes, such as, you know, Airbnb and many others, obviously around the world. The promotion of circular economy, which maximizes resource efficiency. Cutting out the peaks, technology such as AI, and IoT can help deliver solutions that make existing infrastructures and systems into more efficient products, roads, water, et cetera. Small scale infrastructure, co-generation, co-heating, co-cooling, tri-generation, and so much more. People-centered innovation, augmented humans. That is to say, we don't believe in artificial intelligence, really, we believe in augmented intelligence, advances in sensors, optics, and embedded processors. Uh, the internet of pipes that facilitates uh, data gathering and monitoring of pipe performance, for example, a sharing city, a platform city, and so many others, and radical redesign, spatial planning, uh, energy grids, collaboration, and the future of work. So we should be thinking of the fourth IR and how it will transform the city, and this has been adapted from great work that we've done and the World Economic Forum has really advanced. Is, is impacting physical infrastructure and impact how they are utilized, repaired, strengthened, and repurposed. Digital, fourth IR is reinventing the meaning of digital governance, commerce, communication, uh, and others. Environmental, transforming how we utilize natural resources and towards a circular economy. And political economy, how we engage as individuals, a society, the market, the government, uh, towards inclusive and sustainable prosperity. Now, as, alongside this, we should see that there has really been five technological revolutions in cities. Uh, the first one, canal, canal mania, was really part of the agricultural transformation. Uh, the second, for, the, the last four, railways and public transport, steel engineering and finance, automobiles, oil, mass production, and now the megalopolis very much aligns with the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions.
So what we see is a concomitant transformation in cities as we see the transformation in the, the various industrial revolutions uh, emerge and spread. The smart city is a modern proposition, but let's not forget urban innovations have been with us for thousands of years. Certainly in China and in India and all uh, Egypt, many other places, urban innovations have been part of what we know since recorded history and, and even before. The current chapter in urban innovation is roughly two decades old and is driven by harnessing the data revolution and the fourth industrial revolution. From basic connectivity to ubiquitous connectivity to early IoT, Internet of Things, single point solutions to now complex interdependent systems, data driven, uh, VR, using VR, AR, XR, AI, drones, and so much more. The future is incredibly bright, and I hope that what I am sharing here will, will also create a sense of optimism and possibilities because what's occurring in China um, in, around smart cities and, and regions is really transformative and modeling a pathway for the future and many other parts of the world as well. What is then digitalization? Digitization is the act of translating something from an analog format into a digital one. This has proceeded pretty dramatically. But digitalization, which is the intersection of harnessing the data revolution and the fourth industrial revolution, addresses the core processes of our organizations and social and economic life by means of a network design, digital technologies, and the organizational structures, values, rules, and expectations they embody. One way to think about this and, and recognize this is through we digitize music from vinyl to CD. But then music got digitalized, new business and delivery models, revolutionizing the industry, obviously using our uh, apps and phones and uh, increasingly fast three and then four and then now 5G networks. The network paradigm is really the birth of distributedness. And when we think about urban innovation, smart cities, and the use of the data revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, we really are moving from centralized to decentralized to distributed and networks, where the prime principle is not coordination, but coherence. Not co coordination, but coherence. So we see this in various different types of areas. Uh, I won't go through all of these. We know these are happening all over the world in different forms. Now, the smart community, digitalization can be applied to drive efficiencies. In short, optimizing old ways of doing things. But digitalization can also be applied to drive dramatically modes of city operations and human conduct within them. And we see this certainly across uh, many cities in China and around the world. There is digitalization happening across all domains, healthcare, and certainly this has accelerated certainly uh, since the pandemic, mobility, um, work, the future of works, and which is no longer the future of work, but the present of work, citizen services, the delivery of water, electricity, waste, and, and the rest, logistics, environment, energy, learning uh, and aging well. So here are some exemplars, certainly smart lights, are probably the easiest and lowest hanging fruit. Surprisingly, around the world, we still have far too little of this happening systematically and at scale, but it's such an easy thing to do and one that we must advance dramatically and digitalization, the harnessing data revolution, fourth IR, make this incredibly accessible. Obviously we add to that uh, renewable power, and now we've really transformed the urban ecosystem uh, dramatically. Smart waste, reduction in collection costs, no missed pickups, so citizen services at high delivery, at high satisfaction, reduced overflows, waste generation analysis, and of course, CO2 emission reduction. So these things are remarkable in their integrated capacities to both create um, healthy cities, sustainable cities, prosperous cities, uh, and cities that create um, meaning and joy for its uh, citizens. Obviously, we also have to go beyond the fishes, embrace the shift more dramatically, automated digitalized mobility in the, in the future of parking. We really do have to have a massive rethink for urban spatial planners all over the world with fully automated vehicles, which are on their way and coming smart parking in downtown areas and cities becomes a 21st century solution to a 20th century problem. And then, of course, distributed network digitalized smart energy grids, which create circular uh, energy flows uh, that create um, possibilities uh, where new business models, where demand can be responded to with 
um, AI and automated uh, uh, information systems, uh, energy trading, uh, using going beyond the consumer and the supplier to the prosumer and optimize renewables. So the future of work, the future of residential, the future of the built environment, that's really what we're looking at by harnessing the data revolution and the fourth industrial revolution for the smart, sustainable and prosperous cities of today and the future. Network living, new residential propositions, cross-generational, uh, healthy uh, and, and sustainable, living as a service, new models for residential life, particularly for our aging population, but also for our youth. The ever more distributed nature of work so that uh, those working from home are still connected to one another and the city and the community more generally. Certainly the impact of COVID-19, which has led to uh, resilience, the need to focus even more greatly on the resilience of the built environment and hygiene 4.0. And the impact of COVID-19 is really accelerating the notion of the 15 minute neighborhood with all critical services at a 15 minute walking distance maximum. So as I go wrap up, uh, I wanna focus on another piece of it. Our previous speaker, very distinguished and a wonderful presentation, talked much about the tremendous advances, yet still challenges on ecosystem restoration uh, in China. One critical pillar of ecosystem restoration is climate restoration. And, one, and climate restoration is a critical third pillar of climate transformation. We all know in terms of mitigation, we must get to 1.5 degrees, at the very least two degrees Celsius, uh, decarbonize and move forward in terms of a, uh, uh, that effort uh, dramatically over the next 10 to 30 years. Adaptation, climate change has happened. There have been uh, manifold changes in ecosystems as a result of the, of the change of the climate. And so we must adapt. But a third critical pillar is restoration. And what we mean by restoration is largely that humans flourished between 250 and 300 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, we are now at 400 to 420 uh, and, and, and headed towards 450 or not higher. What we have to do in addition to get to 1.5, which we must, as well as adapt to the climate changes that have occurred in our cities, in our ecosystems, in our rural areas, uh, we must uh, remove that legacy carbon from the atmosphere and ensure that we can return to a, a, a state of uh, the atmosphere at around 300 parts per million. And what's exciting about this and where the city plays a role is that the economic opportunities for a carbon removal we estimated in a white paper we shared at the World Economic Forum are around three to $5 trillion a year by 2030. As you can see from this slide, there is increasingly cost competitive uh, solutions uh, in, um, for, for carbon removal relative to current um, uh, products uh, and services on the market. I wanna focus just, and so when we see this cost curve dr declining dramatically, uh, more and more finance and investing going into the marketplace for these new technological solutions and natural solutions, uh, such as reforestation and land regeneration, which also, by the way, requires the use of new technologies such as AI and harnessing the data revolution, particularly geospatial data and earth observation data. But as you can see here, and what I wanna share with you next is that there are all sorts of new technologies, particularly that can advance carbon removal and, and lead to uh, a, a more sustainable, equitable and prosperous set of cities. So for example, building materials, negative carbon building materials, we see as a dramatic growth opportunity uh, in the marketplace. And this is just one example. There are many, many companies around the world, uh, synthetic limestone, many other types of building materials that sequester carbon for 50 to 100 years of time have become cost competitive with conventional building materials. And so we see this as an incredible opportunity to create a green economy within the city using negative carbon building materials. A uh, next one is of course, uh, direct air capture. And across cities uh, in the world, we see the dramatic increase. We'll see the dramatic increase of um, dr uh, direct air capture. We're now becoming incredibly cost co uh, competitive with direct air, air capture. It's gone from $1,000 a ton to $100 a ton, and it's continuing to go down. Whether it's the mechanical tree that was invented by my colleague, Professor Klaus Knockler at ASU, 
and is now being commercialized by Silicon Kingdom Holdings, or um, the work of carbon engineering, and many others around the world. We see direct air capture as an incredible opportunity. But let me just go back to that once the carbon is captured, there is the opportunity for us to think in a circular economy way of the use of carbon as an input rather than just an externality. And the city is going to be the site of that and harnessing the data revolution and various technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are gonna be critical to this advancing of this third critical pillar that is carbon removal and climate restoration uh, towards climate transformation. So I want to end now, and I believe I've done pretty well in terms of time to just remind ourselves that we are here in the decade of action uh, that we have a critical SDG goal on sustainable cities and communities. No point in the last 30 years, and I would say in human history really, do we have the capabilities, uh, intellectual, technological, institutional, economic, to create uh, eco-civilization in, in, in smart, sustainable, and prosperous cities. And the key drivers of this are us leading and managing, mobilizing and maximizing the benefits and the possibilities of the data revolution uh, and the fourth industrial revolution. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much for allowing me to join you. Um, and uh, I'm open to obviously questions in the chat or in other ways. Back to our distinguished chair. Thank you, Sanjeev. And uh, the technology is really very important. And the te technology and uh, will make the city smarter. And of course, also cities can contribute a lot to, uh, to our strategy for the climate change. And we will take question. As I mentioned, actually, there are, there are several thousand people on the land. So they would have, have a lot of questions uh, for the speakers. Thank you. And now let's, let's invite the fourth speaker, Professor uh, Peng Gong. And uh, he, he is a professor and the chair uh, at the Department of Earth System Science, also the Dean of the School of Science at Tsinghua University. Professor Gong's research interest include global land service change, public health, temporal and spatial spread of cysis. Uh, Malaria and avian influenza, and he received a number of honors and awards, including the outstanding contribution contribution award in remote sensing from the AAG in 2008, and the Tobert um, Abrams Grand Award from the American Society for Photogrammetry and the Remote Sensing in '94. And actually, probably you know he, he will be the vice president of Hong Kong University soon. Let's welcome Professor Kong Kong to talk about the health cities and planetary health and eco civilization. Welcome. Sorry that uh, we are still testing a little bit about the uh, system. But thank you very much for Professor Liu Zhi and also Professor He Chan Fei for the in, uh, invitation and also uh, introduction. Um, today, what I am bringing to the group um, is a topic on healthy cities, planetary health, and also uh, draw some relationships uh, to eco-civilization and see whether or not we will have time to further discuss about that. Um, what has been um, hanging in my mind is a question, how would the urban, uh, how would the cities in the future look like? Um, we could uh, look at uh, a few things. Now we pay a lot of attention to technology, but how would city scale change in time? 
in terms of GDP, in terms of population, in terms of this transportation, energy use, and also the other things, including health condition. Later, you will hear from me talking about this. And uh, uh, our previous uh, speaker, Sanjeev, just talked about uh, the data. You know, monitoring data, the progress of that would have a big uh, implication on our practices of urban planning and thinking about developing sustainable future cities. Um, also, I'm wondering about what theoretical breakthrough can be achieved um, as we move into future cities. And we need to inherit previous principles and uh, uh, traditions of urban planning, but also thinking about how should we move beyond that and develop new urban planning in the future. Because the world, as uh, Ruth de Vries has already pointed out, is highly connected. It's a globalized world. We need more systematic, quantitative, and multidisciplinary and multidepartmental thinking, and with a focus on the well being of the human uh, uh, urban residents rather than on GDP or other things. So these are all the global trends. And lastly, how do we assess gradually on urban, assess, uh, on urban development as we move into future cities? So these are the things that uh, has been um, um, discussed and uh, my group has been working on these issues. Uh, first, let's just take a look at the, the issue of scale. Uh, it started from the United States. Some scholars from uh, Los Alamos uh, National Lab and uh, Santa Fe Institute uh, begin to uh, point out that there is a log scale existing between, you know, if you take the population of a city and take a group of cities and plot them there, you take the log and try to draw some linkages with that uh, urban development. You can think about uh, uh, GDP, you can think about uh, the total miles of the uh, road um, developed in the cities and with a number of other things that we could think of. So you find that there's a superlinearity <clears throat> when you take the log log scale, that there's a, a linear relationship. Um, I don't want to go into more specific details as I put in this particular equation, but just like when we do statistical analysis that uh, we could draw uh, from those scatter plots to the fitted curve and try to find the residue and using that positive and negative residue to, to look at who is more advanced and who is lagging behind, which we will take a look at later. Would this kind of rules uh, be applicable to other part of the world? For example, uh, this similar group, uh, uh, Louis uh, Bettencourt, who is now working at University of Chicago, uh, and his colleagues are applying that to China, you know, using the prefecture level cities and try to uh, draw a similar um, comparison. Um, it turned out to be that the, curve, the scatter plots are more widely, not so linear. Um, and they blame that the data in China that are not so um, uh, well um, surveyed, um, which we know there are problems related to that. Um, and also they find that uh, a long time, the coefficients in the fitted uh, models are changing. <clears throat> so what yeah. happens? You know, if, we, uh, if there is a general uh, generality in this kind of skill model, it would be great that we could use the past to project into the future. And we could also use um, lessons learned from other countries and to apply it to China. It turned out to be that uh, the Chinese data doesn't really fully in agreement with what we learned from the United States. So these are the areas that, that what the other driving parameters that are causing those changes. If you look at, uh, this is still in their work, that like what I said, you take the residue and take a look, 
you find that those um, highly energy driven, uh, economically developed uh, cities, including uh, you know Erdos um, in Inner Mongolia, it's in the leading way. That means that they, they are exceeding the super linear curve. But also Shenzhen, highly technologically developed cities are in the having the positive uh, residue. And uh, cities like Chongqing, you know, it, in the Western part, they are not really, um, they are actually lagging behind. So those are the kind of relationships that we need to look at the, the bias and take the bigger bias and try to, to learn from those and what are the dragging or the driving factors of causing uh, the deviation of a model like that. So this is part of the work that overall, you know, goal that we are trying to learn the general rules about the world urban development as we move into the future with the skills of the cities in terms of population, GDP, and other uh, perhaps economic sub factors would um, project as what the models uh, we have built from the past. So this is something that I would like to share with everyone. I think that it's related to this particular uh, theme of this uh, um, today's um, um, forum. So next, I'd like to share with um, everyone on when we move to the inside of the city, and what is the importance, you know, bring uh, one dimension to the to our today's talk on health. So the WHO defined health, healthy cities as one that is continually developing uh, those policies and uh, creating those physical and social environment, which enables its people uh, to mutually support each other in carrying out all functions of life and achieving their full potential in this particular city. Um, so how, how are we doing in China? So we prepared a, a, a report. Basically, this is the United Commission report by Lancet and published two years ago um, on uh, examining uh, the progress and, and challenges of China's healthy city development and uh, coming up with some recommendations for future movement. And one of the recommendations is that we would like to keep publishing a progress report on healthy city development in China. And hopefully uh, in the future, we will be able to have him, uh, to add a global context to our uh, exercise. In China, um, we uh, already uh, observe the so continuing urbanization, and particularly for the past 30 years, you know, since 1990, uh, although the economic uh, open um, uh, uh, door policy has been reform and open door policy has been starting from 1978, the real urban takeoff fly is starting from the 1990s. And China, we today the topic is very relevant. We're developing an eco-civilization society. And recently in 2015 or so, the state council came up with a new type of urbanization. And also in the mid 1990s, uh, chi China has test pilot the healthy city development. If you look at uh, this is part of the work that I am uh, uh, specializing, you know, using satellite to track urban expansion. You can see that uh, recently we did this for the whole world, but for China, starting from the 1980s to 2018, China's urbanized land has increased more than 13 times. So it's a huge expansion of land uh, urbanization. But what about the population? Uh, population, we know that uh, starting from about a 19% uh, urban population in 1978 uh, to about, we are already nearly 60% now of urbanization uh, of population. 
uh, we can imagine that China has added more than uh, 700 million population into the cities uh, during the past 40 years. So, but that's um, a ratio of about 1. Uh, 150 million to, to uh, 80, uh, you know, uh, nearly 80, uh, 800 million population. So the big difference is only about five uh, times or so. But the land, we are increasing for more than that, you know, 13 times or so. So that's a big, uh, we have a faster land urbanization than population urbanization. But during those past uh, 30 years time, we can see that as the urbanization uh, increases, that China's urban life expectancy is increasing. Although this is not even uh, for ladies and for women and uh, men, but uh, overall we are increasing. And cutting those short period in the 1990s, 2000, 2010, 2015, you can see the uh, increase of the proportion of urban population uh, has a strong, uh, stronger and steeper uh, dependence. Um, the, the life expectancy is having a stronger dependence on the uh, urbanization rate. <clears throat> uh, so those are some good things, you know, the, the health is in, increasing, people are living longer in the urbanized area, but there are major challenges. Non-communicable disease burden are increasing, emerging infectious disease are outbreaking in China for three times since 2003. And we are facing with the aging population and the uh, health uh, reform, actually it's uh, during the past, we, we are experiencing some difficulties. We observe that there's a rising health uh, expenditure and there's a health inequity um, problems. Um, as uh, some example, we can see that, uh, for example, cancer rates uh, in more recent years are having a high, we are experiencing higher cancer rate than in the 1990s. For the non-communicable diseases, there are a number of uh, increasing concerns, concerns on the risk factors, including air pollution, water pollution, low level of physical activities, unbalanced diets, tobacco and harmful use of alcohol, and extreme weather events, particularly extreme heat, and also metabolic uh, risk factors. So those are all the aspects that are uh, affecting our non-communicable non non diseases. On the infectious disease side, uh, we, are, we are happy to see many of them are, as time goes, are reducing uh, the prevalence rate, but some sexually or blood uh, related infectious disease are increasing. So that's uh, some increasing concern and the extra burden to our health uh, system in, in cities. In addition, injuries and mental health, particularly injuries caused by falls, traffic and natural hazards, and also mental health are the under report. You know, lots of people are experiencing problems, but we didn't really detect. So those are all uh, affecting the urban health issues in China. Aging, I have already mentioned, and the health expenditure uh, and health equity. So the Chinese government has been taking actions for example, that they are controlling environmental pollution, improving the livability of cities, and enhancing disease prevention and control, and also reform the health sector. But that still remains to be, uh, there's a big momentum we need to do more to improve the particular situation. And as I said, in the 1994, uh, mid 1990s, we, we began to do a pilot program on healthy cities. So these are some of the examples in the report. And uh, in addition, uh, in, the 19, in 1990, uh, China has built a hygienic city movement. 
This is a very rigorous, more than 100 items to be examined in a particular city to see whether or not they meet the standards, uh, a particular threshold, uh, then a city will be um, entitled uh, hygienic city. So some of the Western cities, they are basically given up because they wouldn't really be able to meet the 100 some uh, indicators and to pass their requirement. So, uh, but this actually helps China to improve uh, the environmental aspect of the uh, um, uh, healthy cities development. Um, so now, starting from uh, 2016, there is expansion of the pilot of healthy cities. And they're hoping, uh, currently there are 30, 38 cities who are um, under uh, the uh, construction uh, as a pilot. There are some gaps we find that the complexity of urban health in inadequately uh, comprehended and uh, uh, piecemeal actions are happening. That means that we are not having a systematic approach to attack the uh, urban health issues. There's also, uh, we find that uh, the effort is primarily from a top-down approach and there's a lack of wide participation. Uh, the third is that, uh, as we often observe, that the governmental de departments are not uh, cooperating with each other sufficiently in addressing issues. And uh, lastly, we need more actions to improve health equity. So we proposed in the, this particular commission report that we use healthy cities. Um, we need to take a systematic approach for managing the urban health. And we need a whole uh, government and whole society participation and address the environmental and social determinants of health, um, uh, urban health issues. And uh, we believe that cities have the, it's a favorable political and socioeconomic uh, units that they are able to support the achievement uh, of uh, allocate resources to uh, promote uh, science and technology to support healthy city development. And China at this particular time, at this particular economic growth level, um, it, it's the right time to develop a more widely healthy cities. And uh, there are many proposals for large scale uh, urban development are still ongoing. Uh, there, uh, we are now entering into a smart city and uh, AI and fourth industrial revolution time. There are technological advancements that are ready. And uh, the success of hygienic city movement are also helpful. And cities have the right uh, political will and also then so does the country. So we came up with five recommendations. The first is to integrate health into all policies and start King Farm urban planning. So in future urban planning, we need to take health into consideration. And the other parts I more or less uh, proposed and, uh, and mentioned, you know, that is the participation to be fuller and intersectoral collaboration to be uh, stronger. And we actually propose that we set up goals to um, monitor, we build an indicator system to monitor healthy city development, which is now undergoing by the uh, government. And also we think that a third party uh, assessment is also necessary using taking advantage of the hugely available uh, social uh, big data. And lastly, we need still continue to enhance research and education on healthy cities. And also we think private sectors can play a big role because they uh, recruit more than 80% city uh, employees and they, they are also uh, producing uh, about 60% of the uh, economic output. So their uh, actions will help the employees and to read it through into the society. 
So uh, using cities uh, as the focus, but we also, as what uh, Ruth and Professor uh, Bo Jie Fu has pointed out, that uh, uh, we need to think about the nature. We need to think about what is surrounding the cities. So I would also like to draw our attention to planetary health uh, or one house. Richard Houghton, the editor-in-chief uh, of Lancet, um, has uh, came up with this particular concept. He said, put it simply, planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. So in 2013 and thereafter, uh, there was uh, a commission uh, uh, constructed to develop a report on planetary health. So this has eventually uh, ended up with a publication in Lancet on planetary health in November 14, just about five years ago. And now we are uh, uh, actually assembling up a new uh, commission to do a second report on planetary health. So it came up with the background that in the Anthropocene that our health and the well-being are being improving at a cost of a continuing uh, increase um, of population and poverty and also um, resource use. For example, uh, water, um, uh, tropical forest loss, uh, ocean acidification, and also, of course, biodiversity uh, extinction and uh, loss. Uh, plus, uh, there's uh, the climate change, as what we discussed earlier. So there are people who are looking at all the different dimensions and putting uh, up a concept of planetary boundaries and also tipping points um, uh, to indicate that we don't want to exceed certain threshold of uh, uh, unsafe, and we don't want to uh, reach and exceed certain tipping points so that on certain dimension of the uh, mother planet, we are going to experience a point of no return. Our whole state change will cause us disastrous consequences of our human society. So there are all sorts of effects of uh, environmental change on food availability, which is one part of the health determinant, in, uh, which uh, Ruth de Fris in the first report has also uh, talked about. Land degradation, Professor Fu Jie mentioned, water scarcity, loss of pollinators, and overfishing and climate change are all the threatening factors to food uh, uh, security of the world. There are health impact um, from uh, those planetary boundary uh, factors. For example, climate change, uh, stratospheric ozone depletion, forest clearance and land cover change, land degradation, uh, wetland loss and damage, biodiversity loss, freshwater depletion, and uh, contamination, urbanization and its effects, and all of this and damage to coastal reefs uh, and ecosystems. All of these are having a consequence and affect uh, our human health. So the solution we came up with, there are economical and financial solutions, which I uh, didn't really put in here, but we need to develop sustainable and healthy cities, just as uh, Sanjeev has mentioned earlier in his uh, final uh, talk. Um, so we, we need to take active travel and public transportation, reduce fine particulate air pollution, building more green spaces, increasing biodiversity, reduce urban heat island, and, and reduce mental health, to, and uh, uh, build watershed conservation, and uh, make healthy food more accessible, which Ruth de Fris has stressed earlier, and also increase resilience to flood storms and droughts. Restoring ecosystems 
play an essential role in regulating fr freshwater quantity and quality. Uh, lots of the cities are suffering from this and there's uh, uncertainties for their futures. Um, and uh, one aspect that uh, we should pay attention with sometimes doesn't uh, really uh, recognize along the food supply chain, there's a huge loss of food. More than one third of the food has have been wasted. So we need, try, we need to avoid this. And of course, we need to examine our urban system to be um, more resilient. And we need to make voluntary family planning more available widely to the world to avoid the population explosion. Now, are we able to do that? Uh, I think so, but we are actually uh, missing some uh, critical components. I think in China, for example, I'm, I want to go back to urban planning. Uh, look at this is Qinghua campus. When people know that we need to block to separate uh, bicycles, pedestrians, and also cars. We put uh, those uh, uh, barriers, but we put the barriers to where people need to be uh, passing across the road. Now, these are the things that uh, we could consider the piecemeal solution of uh, our urban development or campus development. I mean, so uh, also we have the cross road to end up with some green uh, 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 green space. You know, you, do you expect people to just step onto those green sp st space? So when we find these situations, we could tell the uh, administrators to make a change. For example, here, people riding a bicycle in the night that they will easily hurt themselves, causing injuries. And there's on busy uh, road sectors, there's no pedestrian line. So there are all sorts of things that you can find in Beijing. But if we tell the government that they will make changes, but they only change those locations that we point out, there's no systematic solutions. So those are the issues that I would like to bring us uh, our attention. There are still uh, in many parts of the city that there are uh, no pedestrian uh, sidewalk lines. So these are all the issues that we should pay attention to. So uh, coming to an end that we seem to understand from long before that we need to use rulers and regulators to help us to uh, guide our performance and our activities and also guide our urban development and planning, but we are not really materializing them in our actual uh, action. Taking today's advantage of big data and evidence, we need data-driven and evidence-driven urban development and also urban planning. To plan for the future, we need uh, what you know has been already discussed before and hopefully taking health into our consideration. Not like in the past, we put uh, the governors or uh, the administrators will onto a piece of paper. We really need to be quantitative, um, uh, global uh, with systematic thinking, global thinking, multidisciplinary, taking multidisciplinary approaches to plan for the future cities. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gong. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, this one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Gong. And uh, apparently, a health city is very important for our life. And uh, our build a health city is a systematic project. It's not easy. <laughs> In every part, the getting involved. And uh, actually, I also just checked in the, in the broadcast room, there are about 2,700 people there in, in one class, one room. 
And uh, okay, let's welcome let's welcome the last speaker of this morning, and Professor Xu Xu Jintao, and uh, he is a professor and director at the China Center for Energy and Development, National School of Development of Peking University. His research interests to cover comparative studies of forest management system in developed and developing countries, Eco economics of climate policy and international negotiations, transport management policy and water rights, water pricing reform in China. Uh, he also serves as a member of the Asian Pacific Forest Policy Think Tank, FAO, the United, United Nations and also a member of Council of Scientific Advisors, Global Adaptation Institute, and the senior expert of China Green Carbon Fund. And he will talk about China's transition toward a green and a low carbon economy. Let's welcome Professor Xu. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ho San Fei and Liu Zhi and the audience. It's, it's, it's an honor to speak at Beijing Forum. Uh, uh, today, my topic is about China's economic transition from a, yeah, basically China's economic transition onto a green and a low carbon uh, path. You know, China has been uh, uh, in the low growth path for se several years, seven to eight years. So we call it a new normal. With the pandemic this year, people worried about future economic growth. And you know, economic growth from economic perspective are basically driven by three uh, vehicles, consumption, export, and the investment. And previous three decades, our growth is mainly driven by export or trade. Uh, in the future, people don't believe we will continue to rely on export and can sustain our economic growth. So in the future, economic growth will mostly from domestic consumption. So we call it the inner circle, inner cycle, I don't know. We're, 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 yeah, we're talking about the double cycling and the inner cycling, okay. So why Domestic, why people believe that domestic consumption can give China stronger growth in the future. It is because, so there, there are several colleagues at National School who are optimistic about this uh, perspective. The key reason is urbanization, today's topic. You know, yesterday, Professor Yao Yang had a speech. Basically, he pointed out the static potential of urbanization in China still like 20%. We, if we can remove a few obstacles, uh, we can immediately have 20% more urbanization. That's a, that's a huge boost for consumption. So we need to remove policy obstacles, but also Related to today's topic, we need to have a higher quality urbanization in order to attract rural population into urban sector and give them better service, higher quality livelihood. Then we have, then it will become a driver of China's future economic growth. So that's the demand side story for future growth. And today, uh, 
my focus is mainly on supply side. How do we supply high quality urbanized urbanization? How do we make high quality urbanization happen? So basically, it's a supply side story, and we call it the economic transition toward a green and a low carbon path. You know, changing, I believe, changing growth pattern is not only important for China to sustain China's economic growth in the future. It is also important for the world. And this slide is evident for my assertion why China's economic transition or change of economic growth model is also important for the global, for, for, for the world. The upper picture, so the, the, these pictures are taken from climate website after Paris uh, summit. Okay, the upper picture basically show, shows that from 1990 to 2002, the, the carbon emission grew in the world grew very slowly. But after 2002, it suddenly picked up speed and we, we, we had the abnormal growth of carbon emission. By year 2010, comparing to the trend line from 1990 to 2002, we had the world emitted an additional amount of CO2 by the scale of 5 billion tons. Okay, the lower picture is China's carbon emission path. So from 1990 to 2002, China's carbon emission was, yeah, grew very slowly, basically. But after 2002, we had a abnormally higher carbon uh, emission growth. By 2010, that abnormal increase of carbon emission is around 4 billion tons. So, Combining these two pictures, yeah, it basically indicates that the huge increase in carbon emission after 2002 was mainly driven by huge increase of carbon emission in China. So China contributed to this abnormal growth by 80%. So if the world is to contain carbon emission, uh, China must contain our carbon emission. And there are a lot of uh, discussion in the history about China's growth pattern or growth model. Very famous uh, statement by Paul Krugman and Owen Young in the 90s. Basically, it is very, it, the, paper, the articles by Owen Young and Paul Krugman in the 90s basically stirred a lot of uh, debate. So basically their, yeah, basically their uh, statement is that uh, not only the four small dragon in Asia, but China, the growth pattern can be characterized by high inputs, low productivity. Recently, a lot of there, there's also a new, new interest on China's economic model change, but it, with a focus on population change, because we, we, we're moving toward the aging society, our labor force are declining, and uh, China encountered this lowest turning point. Uh, environmental perspectives are largely missing in this mainstream discussion. So this is, this is, this is a point I'm adding in this talk. The year 2002 is the first year of China, China's accession into WTO. So China suddenly had a much larger world market to deal with. Then the free trade allowed an economy to discover its comparative advantage. Without free trade, we don't know our comparative advantage. With free trade, with trade with different partners, then market will adjust to let each economy 
to utilize its comparative advantage, the cheapest resources to, to benefit from the world market. So WTO is a, was an opportunity for China, not only for the growth, but also realize its comparative advantage. So this is the focus of this paper. How do we discover China? What kind of a comparative advantage that supports China's growth, extraordinary growth after WTO? Okay. This figure indicates that uh, between 2002 and 2008, that's the golden age of China's WTO uh, period. We, we, yeah, we learned that the growth of trade value, trade value, the growth, growth of GDP and the growth of CO2 emission move parallelly. So there must be some connection between these three. First, WTO allow China to fully, fully utilize free world market. Then, then the export became China's main vehicle of economic growth. But what happened to environment, to CO2 emission? That's, that's our uh, focus of interest. So I will use a pretty narrow, narrow angle to, to, to tap into this debate about China's economic growth model. So we're testing the pollution haven hypothesis or pollution haven effects. Basically it happens when trade expands, then Pollution haven hypothesis indicated that when trade expands, the, the polluting capital will move from more advanced market to a little less advanced market because the more advanced market has high, uh, stronger environmental regulation. The less advanced market has weaker environmental regulation. So free trade will allow this polluting capital to move around the world and, and go to the place with the weakest environmental regulation. So the competing hypothesis given the dividend of population. So people believe, used to believe China benefiting from WTO system is because of China has the cheapest labor in the world. But uh, and whether that is happening, actually it's an empirical question. Uh, an American colleague called Eric Levinson from the University of Georgetown. So if you look at the search literature on pollution haven hypothesis, 80% of the papers are written by Levinson. So, but uh, most of his paper was examining, we examining the evidence of pollution haven hypothesis using US data, whether there's polluting capital moving across states or whether the polluting capital moving across nations. But most of his paper couldn't find evidence on pollution haven. So he, he, he didn't, his most famous paper published, JPEAR, indicated that the no significant, uh, statistically significant evidence on uh, pollution haven effects in the US. What about China? Can we examine that from the other end of the world? Okay, just looking at the GDP growth among trading partners in year, year 2000, year two, around year 2000, we have to negotiate with all these main trading partners led by the US in order to access to WTO. Look at the economic growth pattern, China's GDP. So, and this is China. So, okay, China's GDP growth. So the scale is low, but the growth rate is very high after 2002. Same, same trend on CO2 emission. So this blue line jumped up after 2002 is China CO2 emission. You can see after the year 2002, major emitting country like US and the region like European Union and other regions, 
most of the develop, developed world, they're still to emission, stabilized and declining. But China is except, was the exception of the year 2002. And the China CO2 emission accelerated. And we would like to see if there's causal relations between these two different trends. And China's CO2 emission became, China became the world's largest CO2 emitter around 2006, when both China and the US were 20% of the world total. Now, by year 2011, China, China was close to 30%. US is 15%. So if you go to a world climate conference, People talk about U.S. federal government retreating from, but uh, mainly the pressure is on China. The pressure is for China to commit more aggressively for carbon reduction. Okay, we use, uh, yeah, we use an economic method called the synthetic control method to identify the relationship between China's entry into WTO on uh, China's CO2 emission and the major partners' CO2 emission, okay? And uh, we use a carbon emission prediction formula by Professor Wang Chan and Chen Jining and Zhou Ji. You know, before Chen Jining became Minister of Environmental Protection and the mayor, he was a very good scholar. Okay, so the, the idea of synthetic control is that in economics, if when we want to find out a causal relationship, identification strategy is always the most difficult thing. How do we measure the impact of WTO entry on China's carbon emission and on China, the trading partners' carbon emission? The difficulty is we didn't, we couldn't, we don't observe China's carbon emission if China didn't getting into WTO. We only observe China's actual carbon emission before and after China's WTO entry. But uh, we, we don't observe China's emission if China didn't enter WTO. So we have to find a counterfactual China and representing China's emission if China was not in WTO. So this dotted line basically is a counterfactual China using a synthetic control method. The method basically is that we use some uh, algorithm, statistical uh, method, algorithm to find out, to come up with a set of weights allocated, optimal set of weights allocated to a rele relevant number of countries or regions. <laughs> like uh, mid-income countries, low, low mid-income countries, uh, like uh, ASEAN countries. So the, con the country block large enough and comparable to Chinese economy. And uh, not all the country block had, had a ways, some of them. Uh, here, like mid-income country, uh, low income, low mid-income, I actually forget about this, uh, uh, symbols, but basically they are country blocks and uh, allocate uh, having weights on this synthetic uh, formula. And with these weights, we can use one time so uh, uh, changing this formula, we can ask these, this synthetic China or counterfactual China to predict carbon emission. Actually, this synthetic China predict China's carbon emission pretty well before 2002. Then we believe it will be predict China's carbon emission for if China was not in WTO. So the dotted line basically is a predict trend of China's carbon emission if China was not in WTO. It's a counterfactual uh, in carbon emission path. The real line, the it's, it's China's actual car, uh, carbon emission. So the difference between these two lines representing WTO's impact on China's CO2 emission, it, it clearly indicates 
WTO in, uh, carbon emission increase because of China's WTO uh, entry. And uh, other domestic pollutants like uh, uh, NOx. Uh, and the, the other side of the story of this pollution haven effects is our trade partner decrease their carbon emission because of China's WTO. In the US, carbon emission has been declining for many reasons. And I argue that China's entry into WTO, US-China became the top trade partner for each other after 2002 quickly, was a main driver of US decline in carbon emission. And this is the evidence. The dotted line is a counterfactual US, as if China was not in WTO. Uh, the real line is US actual CO2 emission. The difference represents the decrease of CO2 emission from US because of China's WTO emission. So basically using these methods, we kind of prove pollution haven effects existed. And this is major indicator of China's growth pattern. So our China's growth is export driven, but you need the lot of pollution embedded in China's export. And we quickly go through China's export trend. And this is China's total export value from 1995 to 2016. Only a little kink around 2008. And this is all the sectors exporting uh, for China. And so, Unexpectedly, by a, like, I'm not a trade expert. I expect WTO will boost China's export in textile se sector, furniture sector, all these labor intensive sectors. But on the contrary, the sectors benefited the most are not exactly labor intensive sectors. They are medium level capital intensive sectors like electronic, electric materials, electronic equipment and the ordinary machinery and the equipment. And these top two sectors who grow the most after WTO are not exactly labor intensive, they are medium level capital intensive. And I com Combine all the capital intensive sector and the labor intensive sector. The red represent capital intensive sector. The capital intensive sectors grow much more than labor intensive sectors. Why? We used to be told that WTO discovered China's comparative advantage in labor intensive technology. But why this? seemingly trade puzzle, the puzzle that capital, medium capital intensive sector grow much, much more than labor intensive sector. So how to explain this, this trade puzzle? Okay, go back to my environmental perspectives. I calculated carbon footprint for each exporting sectors. This is the picture. You see the top two has huge difference with rest of the rest of the economy, they remain electronic equipment, electric machinery, and ordinary machinery. And combining capital intensive and the labor intensive sectors, you can see the carbon foot footprints from capital intensive sector are much higher than the carbon footprint in the labor intensive sector. And I think this provides an explanation why, why capital intensive sector lead export growth after WTO? Okay, so uh, to put them together, I did a simple growth accounting for export sectors. Basically, basically, every sector, their growth are composed of like uh, inputs, like labor capital, uh, productivity, but I'll add environmental factors in. So uh -huh. basically carbon footprint in, I skip the formulas. And this table basically, the, the last column of the table indicate the share of a carbon footprint, the contribution of the carbon footprint to export growth. It indicate 
between 2001, the contribution is ne was negative, but after 2002, the contribution to export value became huge, 45%. In the meantime, the contribution of, we have decent total factor productivity, but uh, the, that contribution has been the grow much slower than carbon footprint. Okay, summing up, basically I, I review and discuss China's economic growth model for past two decades and using WTO as a key turning point. Basically, China's growth pattern can be characterized by high inputs such as labor capital. But in, my, in our paper, the most important factor is the environment represented by carbon footprint. On the other uh, hand, efficiency and productivity made a decent contribution. In order to compete in the world, you have to have very strong technological change, very strong performance, and very good management. And so slightly different from Krugman, Owen Young, our exporting sector factor, the contribution of TFP made decent contribution. Coming up next, for future five, 10, or 20 years, what will happen for China? So my, my colleague, Yi Ping Huang, uh, summarizes, I think, the best, basically indicating China's growth pattern will change from miraculous growth to normal growth. China's miraculous growth is not so sustainable for the reason as follows. For last three decades, our final products, basically the price of final products are determined by market, but the inputs are highly regulated. Most importantly, financial inputs, money. Money is very cheap for large scale state companies. So you, with this distorted input market, basically the whole society is sub subsidizing manufacturing sectors. Then we have huge growth and very, very strong export. That won't be sustainable. In the future, we have to correct this input market uh, uh, distortion, including the environmental factor market. We have, because we, didn't have effective environmental policy for a long time. It basically means our environmental factors are zero price, the cheapest in the world. That's probably is a more important source of a comparative advantage for China than labor. In the future, we have to correct that in order to have a sustainable growth. In order to do that, we have to, you know, environmental factors don't have market. Clean air, clean water don't have market. We government have to have deliberate policy to correct environmental factor market distortion. Uh, we have to use economic policy, things like environmental tax, carbon tax, carbon trading. And also, if we do that, China's economy has a mechanism to turn to more reliance on total factor productivity. Then we have a sustainable development. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Xu. And uh, China certainly has been has devoted to build a low carbon economy, and we also have promised to do that. <laughs> um, of course, it's not easy. It's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge uh, task. And uh, now, actually, we are open to to the to the audience for for Q and A. And actually, we already collect some some question. And uh, it looks like. The main question goes to Professor Gong Peng. Uh, okay, I just uh, some of them. Uh, okay, first of all, how do we understand health equity, and what is the con cognitive dimension and the specific direction of health equity? This is one question, and another one is about how to create incentive to build health city. And uh, second one, <laughs> third one is about urban resilience. 
urban resilience, how to measure, how to measure urban resilience. And is resilience is a system's ability to recover from damage or continuous learning adaptive, adaptability in continuous development. So I will just give, give you some, some time to, <laughs> to answer this question. Okay. Okay, yeah, microphone. Oh, yeah. Sounds sounds like okay, right? In this room. <clears throat> Should I go to the probably I'll just use this. Would that be okay? I think it's I mean, it turned to turn to you this this camera. <laughs> Is that okay now? Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, uh, thanks to the questions, and uh, these are actually uh, we find the problems. We 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 may not really have a very good solution. Uh, the first thing is about the equity issue in, in China. We can see that there's an urban and rural, and also there's a different population group working in different organizations using, uh, for example, public servants versus workers in the city, that they are <clears throat> being treated with uh, different uh, um, uh, health uh, uh, insurance programs. Uh, at that time. And now the country is trying to unify the insurance programs. And the equity uh, issue also reflects that a huge amount of personal out-of-pocket uh, 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 payments uh, in different uh, group of people. So those are uh, the problems, as I said, that the, the government is trying to do. A, that's part of uh, a problem that the government should do. And also if we take international experience that the insurance are being uh, held by organizations as we have uh, uh, as i mentioned earlier that more than uh, about 80 percent of the people are uh, employed by businesses and those different businesses have the responsibility and currently that they, they are some of them are trying to meet with uh, the minimum uh, requirement of the government and uh, better companies are having better uh, uh, policies for uh, health uh, benefits. So those uh, there are rooms for those business uh, uh, partners to play a bigger role in uh, maintaining health equity niche. How to create incentives to build healthy cities? Uh, these are actually, we are all hoping, and uh, uh, in China right now, indeed, the biggest incentive is uh, President Xi Jinping would uh, highly, uh, uh, if he is paying attention to something, then there's a big incentive on the party secretary of cities to pay attention to that. <clears throat> The fortunate thing is that this year, uh, unfortunate is COVID-19 is giving us a huge uh, uh, challenge uh, to us and also to the whole world. And we learned a lot of lessons also, and the whole society is paying attention to health, and also our governmental officials are recognizing uh, the importance of uh, uh, health and needing integrated effort to deal with this. So I'm hoping that uh, in the past, as I'm, I'm trying to say, that our governmental officials are listening to President Xi Jinping very carefully, and uh, hopefully that there's a self-momentum and recognizing the importance of this particular issue of health, and uh, uh, to gain more, uh, pay more attention. Uh, there should be policy development that uh, uh, in the city uh, government. Um, to do this. Uh, I also mentioned about the private sector. Of course, every individual in the city, the citizen, should uh, uh, add their awareness of the importance of health 
and then pending their right of uh, uh, enjoying a better uh, life and uh, maintaining their good health, that we all work together. There should be uh, enough uh, a momentum to keep improving the situation. And lastly, about the resilience, it's uh, uh, totally uh, another dimension. I am hoping that my colleagues are able to uh, to do uh, uh, to to uh, uh, introduce. Uh, you know, Ruth is talking about the resilience, and we're talking about one in the city that we are having in this year, you know, uh, in southern China, including COVID-19. You know, the resilience issue is. Uh, 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 obviously, um, a problem in some of the uh, cities when we have the flooding issue. And uh, in Wuhan, we are seeing that uh, uh, if the society acts really well, that we could uh, um, address the health uh, uh, catastrophes um, and uh, bring uh, the uh, citizens in, into. Uh, back to normal life, and hopefully in the whole world that uh, we are able to do this. I know I, with the limited time, I'm not able to fully address the issues. These are all very good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kung. And then the question goes to Professor Sanjeev Kagarin. Are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay, the question is, industrial development brings with many sustainability issues in your research, what principles should be strictly followed to promote sustainable cities with industrial data? Thank you so much. It's an excellent question, and all the questions have been excellent. I, I commend Professor for his answers. I might return to the resilience question. But on this, let me just say that what's exciting about the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution is that they, for the first time in history, could potentially by themselves be much less, much more sustainable than previous generations. Uh, nonetheless, there are many, such as Internet of Things and others that could lead to increased energy use and so forth. Obviously, the fundamental principle should be triple bottom line, economic, social, and environmental optimization. We have to make sure we're, we're, we're uh, assessing and deploying these new technologies as part of the fourth industrial revolution with a multi-criteria approach. Secondly, though, there are ways in which harnessing these technologies can lead to and must lead to greater sustainability and circularity, as I mentioned in my presentation. So as, as, as I, I am an optimist, and I believe that if we harness these new technologies and the underlying data revolution that provides us real-time dynamic disaggregated data for planning and monitoring, as was mentioned by several of the speakers, but also for um, integrated decision-making we are gonna achieve much more sustainable cities than we did in the past. On the resilience question, if I may, I, I absolutely believe that resilience must, be, it must involve adaptation. When we think about the COVID pandemic, it was not just returning to the standard status quo. We will never go back to a pre-COVID-19 state of, of the world and certainly not in cities. Uh, we must adapt to these new realities and there are many new opportunities and accelerated possibilities that have resulted as a result of the, of the pandemic that we must embrace. So resilience should always involve adaptation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we, now we take some question from the, from the in-house audience. So any, any question for these five speakers? You know, is a chair. I would like to also talk about is a resilient city, uh, urban okay. city. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, is a is a city is a complexity is a systems. It's a involve. You know, is a ecological and a social and economic is a suburb cities. For resilient cities, should be also is a. A company is a different system interaction is work together, uh, made establish is a self regulation is a mechanism. That is a, is a resilience cities also is a linked with adaptation. 
Uh, for example, is the city's risk is from the different aspect. It's come from the nature disaster. For example, is the flooding. Uh, also, is a come from is the health is a risk for carbon nineteen and uh, some others. Also, from the economic is a risk and the social is a, is a risk. Is the resilience sectors have is a self adaptation. For example, for nature disaster, we need to keep is a big ecological infrastructure. For example, is the urban river, is the urban stream, is the urban uh, wetland, urban forestry, is a for is against is a nature is a disaster. For is a social is a disaster, we need to the, is a governor. And in the sum is the measures. So also we need is inter interaction with the different is environment is together for for governor is the, is the city. Uh, so this is my point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fu. And uh, any other questions? Uh, Dr. Liu has a question. Um, my question is to Professor mm -hmm. Ruth uh, Devery. Ruth, still here? Professor Ruth? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, Ruth, uh, this is Zi Liu. Um, I, my question is that uh, you know, uh, from the perspective of nature, uh, to look into the, the sustainability of our cities, I think what you say uh, make a lot of sense to us. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear now? Now I, I, you cut off, so if you could start oh, okay. from the beginning, Repeat thank the you. Yeah. And the idea that you present in your presentation is scientifically based. And my question is that, um, uh, do you encounter uh, any major problem to deliver the message to our policy makers? Yes, I think the, um, thank you for the question. So one point to, to, that we need to be clear about is that there are these strategies from nature that are applicable to human civilization and particularly urban civilization, but there are some fundamental differences between nature and human society. Human society takes care of uh, sick, it's sick, and takes care of non-productive members of society. So we don't want to give the message <laughs> that uh, human society, you should be like nature in terms of not taking care of the uh, less fortunate members of society. So that's one aspect uh, to be careful with any policy message. I also think that the, you know, our, our world, our policy world is so, uh, so attuned to thinking that the efficient solution is the best solution the short-term gain is the best gain. You know, the most GDP is the, is the policy that should be followed. But what we learn from nature is that uh, seemingly inefficient investments might actually pay off in the long run and save lives and save money and lead to more resilient societies. So, that's a big hurdle in the shift in the way of thinking that you know, we've become so used to our technological kind of efficiency thinking, which has served us well in some ways, but in other ways, it's making us very um, susceptible and fragile to disruptions. Okay. So I'm not thank sure you. that answered your question, but uh, th thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Any any more question?
not high. I will just add that I quickly. Okay. Um, no, no, um, I will quickly just return back to Resumus. Um, I quickly passed my slides due to time. And uh, obviously, uh, Sanjeev uh, made a very good point uh, of adaptation. Actually, if we listen to uh, uh, Ruth de Vries talk about uh, connectivity, networking, uh, due, uh, redundancy, those are all uh, uh, helpful protections for us to maintain resilience. Uh, so integrated connectivity is one part of that. I think that uh, Ruth also mentioned about regulation. Self-regulating is also a big part of uh, uh, having uh, better capacity to maintain uh, resilience. And uh, um, uh, lastly, of course, our knowledge and whole society's awareness on um, being prepared to respond to uh, uh, resilience is uh, our readiness of uh, response is uh, something that we, we need to accumulate. Uh, diversity is also uh, a guarantee for resilience. So those are the dimensions that I ignore. So I will just point it out. Okay, thank you, Professor Gong. Oh, already 11.50. And if, if no more question, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to thank the five speakers and uh, invite Professor Liu Zi and to come to the, come to the store and make some, make some summary. And then we will close today's sub forum. Let's welcome Professor Liu coming to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Professor He. And now we are getting to the uh, final uh, 10 minutes. And my job is uh, uh, to do a summary and closing of the uh, Beijing Forum uh, subforum. Now I will start to uh, give a bit of information about the Beijing Forum in the past. Um, Beijing Forum is a major umbrella framework and that cover uh, many uh, sub-forums. And each sub-forum uh, would take uh, about two days. We have done this uh, for the last uh, few years twice. And each time we invite uh, 20 to 30 uh, international and domestic scholars uh, to come to discuss uh, the, a number of topics relating to the main theme of the forum. And that lasts for uh, two days. But of course, this year we are constrained by the uh, coronavirus. And so we decide to uh, go online uh, for this uh, forum. And we have uh, three hours, but we are uh, very fortunate uh, to have uh, invited five very distinguished scholars uh, to discuss uh, the ecological civilization and high quality um, uh, urbanization. Now the five uh, scholars cover the topic uh, from a very different uh, perspective. Um, Professor uh, Will Stafford uh, look at the uh, urbanization, look at uh, our cities, and particularly the cities, uh, I mean, the future of our cities from the perspective of the nature. And I think that uh, her presentation is uh, eye-opening for us. And of course, I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, what she has eloquently said in the presentation. But I think uh, there are a couple of things that we can take away uh, from her presentation. Uh, one is that network uh, is important for us. And I, myself, is trained as an economist, and we used to think that redundancy is bad. But now we have a, a different view on redundancy because it's so important to the survival of our urban world. And the second thing uh, we learn is uh, diversity. And diversity means option for us 
And Professor Davies used a food supply to uh, uh, demonstrate the importance of diversity. I think we, we should learn how to um, establish the network and diversity uh, in the city planning and urban construction uh, in the future. A lot to think about. Um, and after we hear uh, uh, Rose's uh, the presentation. Now, Professor Fu uh, uh, Jie uh, gave a definition of an eco-civilization. Uh, and I'm particularly impressed by uh, what he said as the innovative pathway to uh, eco-civilization. And he took a lot of examples about the uh, programs and the effort and that China has taken over many years and to repair and restore the ecological system. And I think the takeaway I have is that um, it's possible to repair and restore the ecological system. And it's also uh, possible to preserve our ecological system uh, even when and we have a rapid urbanization on the other hand. And now we have a top uh, policy priority on eco-civilization. I'm sure uh, uh, for China, I mean, we are facing a, still facing a lot of ecological challenges, but with the past experience uh, that, that we have, and also with the uh, policy emphasis on uh, ecological uh, civilization, and I think uh, in the future, we, are, we should be able uh, to address uh, many of these issues. And Professor Sanjeev Kagram uh, looked into our cities from the technological uh, perspective. And that's fascinating uh, to see how our cities are evolving. I mean, in fact, we live in this environment every day. But I'm learning a few uh, new dragons, and, uh, such as uh, make to work the living, and living as a service, and distributed the nature of work. And the technology today uh, give us uh, optimism and opportunity as demonstrated by uh, Professor Cargram. And in particular, uh, technology is, um, and, uh, is going to play a major role in climate adaptation. And I take note of the Center for Negative Carbon Emissions in the uh, Arizona State University. And this gives us uh, uh, some optimism that uh, uh, eventually we should be able to find some technological solutions for uh, carbon uh, removal, which is uh, so important for the survival of our planet. And now let me turn to Professor uh, Gong Peng. And uh, his subject is a healthy city, planetary health and eco-civilization. And this is an emerging uh, topic uh, in urban development. And now more and more scholars uh, start to pay attention and, uh, to the health aspect of um, uh, urbanization. And I must say in the past, and our city planning and urban policy uh, give a little emphasis on uh, health. Uh, health is very much like a consequence of our policy. Now today, I think uh, the presentation of Professor Gong uh, the, the tells us that uh, health is so important in our urban life and that it should be a big part of our policy and our planning. And more than that, uh, Professor Gong uh, turned to uh, planetary health and look into the health issues all around the world uh, and, and amid urbanization. And pollution, uh, the global pollution is impacting our uh, health uh, through the food chain. And that's uh, uh, what he, he has shown to us uh, in his uh, slide. And on the other hand, we also waste a lot of food. And so we are facing a lot of um, and environmental issues that affect our health. And the question is, uh, what are we going to do uh, with these uh, issues? And so Professor Gong uh, emphasized the role of planning 
and big thinking and also focusing on the very small things that may affect our uh, uh, daily safety. And this is a, uh, also an eye-opening uh, presentation for us and that will lead us to think more about uh, what the future of our cities uh, should look like. And finally, the modern East, um, Professor Xu uh, gave us a presentation of his study on China's economic transition from the environmental perspective. Now, it's very interesting that we, uh, we are always proud that China has grown so fast. But Professor Xu's research uh, indicate to us that the rapid economic growth in China came at a heavy cost or a heavy environmental cost. And his data uh, eloquently uh, show this. And more than that, he looked into the mechanism uh, of economic growth and CO2 uh, emission and also uh, pollution. And finally, uh, on the basis of his research, and uh, he uh, gave a few uh, very solid recommendations. Uh, 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 I am particularly uh, uh, in agreement to the two points. One is uh, correcting the uh, uh, factor input prices, uh, the, which uh, uh, fuel the China economic growth, but also brought in, in environmental consequences. And the second is um, and uh, the recommendations for environmental tax and carbon tax. And so I think uh, in a short three hours, and our five distinguished scholars uh, cover five uh, very interesting topic. And these topics are all very uh, informative and built on a lot of um, research. And it gave us a lot to think about uh, what uh, is the future of our city and what we can do uh, to make the future of our city uh, more sustainable and to make the survival of our planet uh, possible. And it also uh, gave us a lot to think as a scholar, what would be the uh, good research topics uh, in the future. So this is my uh, brief summary of the and uh, the sub forum and now we are, we are coming to the close and i would like to uh, express uh, thanks and to our invited speakers uh, all five speakers who brought so much uh, to uh, our audiences and i also want to thank uh, our team uh, who work behind the scene to make this uh, online sub-forum uh, reasonably successful at this point. That's, uh, that, that's the uh, comment I could make, and I would wait to see uh, more feedback uh, uh, perhaps in the next two days. But I want to tell uh, the audience here and that we have uh, 4,800 audiences online uh, for this uh, subforum. So I'm happy uh, to see that the uh, theme of this uh, subforum attract uh, so many people here. So I will also want to thank uh, everyone who logged online uh, to be with us for the last uh, three hours. And I hope uh, uh, everyone uh, think in the same way as I think that uh, our uh, invited scholars uh, really give us a very, very uh, interesting uh, discussion of the uh, issue and that we care so much at our heart. So thank you very much. And this is the end of the subforum. Uh, hopefully we can uh, see you all uh, the next time, uh, not in a uh, too far future. Thank you very much. Uh, for our guests from the U.S., uh, good night. It's made uh, over in the U.S. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now uh, this is closing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs>